Hi, welcome to the History Talks. I'm your host, Will. This is Sebastian. In this episode, we continue our series on the communist revolutions of the 20th century, and we will be discussing Cuba. So Cuba is an interesting topic, Sebastian, because we're here in Florida, and Cuba is so close to home, and we even have a sizable population of Cubans, of people who have fled the communist rule of Cuba to come to Florida. So Sebastian, tell me, how did the Cuban communist revolution begin? Our story starts in, um, with the Spanish-American War in the, eight, in the 1890s. It was a very short war, um, lasting all lasting um, like a, few, a couple months over the course of, eight, of 1896, mm -hmm. uh, with Teddy Roosevelt's some absolute fearlessness, allowing uh, America to quickly conquer the island of Cuba mm -hmm. and force Spain to concede pretty much all all of their remaining colonial possessions, at least mm -hmm. in the Americas. Right. They or gave in North them, America, right? Yeah, in I mean they had lost South America a long mm. time ago. Okay. Now they had to give up all most of their islands in the Caribbean, mm. the Philippines, and especially an, a Caribbean island known as Cuba. Hmm, okay. Now Cuba was what well, so at this point you're saying did the US take possession of Cuba? The US The US occupied Cuba for mm. a couple of years and I didn't know that. And then they made it into a protectorate, hmm. and then they and then they just let it go and focused on doing other things. Oh, really? So they just wanted to drive Spain out. I mean, they wanted a bunch of islands, but hmm. Cuba, Cuba was too much. They, it was just it was too much trouble. Yeah, for its worth. Okay, is it is it that the population resisted? the U.S., the rule by the U.S. government? Yes. Okay. There were, that that was true in most of the colonies they took, but whereas with something like Puerto, Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. they, the population was at that point too small to do that much, mm -hmm. uh, Cuba's population um, just would rather not be transferred from an imperialist power to an imperialist power that did not respect their culture. Mm -hmm. So, and the U.S., Sugar plantations just weren't the same. Okay, I see. So, they were a, a colony of Spain. The U.S. drove Spain out. They tried to take over. Wasn't worth it. U.S. withdrawal. So, what what are we at? What year are we at now? Like the early 1900s at this point? Yeah, 1907, I believe, okay. is when the release happens. Okay, so 1907. So, what happens then? So, Cuba... So, the U.S. left, but they didn't set up a government when they left. They just kind of... They had a... They had a governor um, when they were occupying it, and then mm. they withdrew, and the governor withdrew, and mm. Cuba was left to do whatever it wanted. Okay. Uh, Spain had done Cuba no favors on the conditions for self-rule side of things. Okay, so 1907. So they are, so at this, with the withdrawal of major powers like Spain at the time, or Spain, or the, the major powers of uh, the U.S. or Spain, um, and they were left with no government, no stable government. So it was ripe for some sort of revolutionary or leader to take over. Yeah. Okay. So they went, at first they went through like a few different military dictatorships and coups. Hmm. But then in 1933, five... Oh, so that, that's, that's quite, a, quite a leap there. We go from 1907 to 1933. Yeah, so various dictators, you know, rule for a couple years and then get deposed and then by a over, different uh, guy. Okay. Okay, so basically you have you have these warlords competing for control over the island. Yeah. Each one might have control for a few years at the most and then somebody else would knock them off. Yeah. Okay. So 1933. So that yeah, because 1907 were pre-Bolshevik, right? Yeah. 1933 Bolsheviks have taken power. So communism is in play, right? Yes. And what happens from there? So, in 1933, five generals form a government called the Pentarchy, an mm. oligarchy that's where the five generals are basically, basically say, all right, if we have a lot, multiple of us, mm -hmm. then it'll be harder for each of us to act, to act on personal gain, so maybe we can finally set up a stable government. Okay. And, 
at first it seems like a success. They mm. draw up a constitution where where um, uh, the, the details are not that important, but what you need to know is that they have a legislature and a president, and okay. the president does have a decent amount of executive power. Hmm. Is the president elected? Yes. Oh, interesting. So was this modeled on the U.S. Constitution in any way? Um, almost certainly in part, hmm. though, interesting. though they may have also drawn on uh, various other Latin American constitutions. Okay, interesting. So they have an elected president, mm -hmm. some sort of elected assembly. Okay. They said there's five oligarchs who are backing this. Are they all Cubans? Yeah. Okay. So this is all this is all self rule. There's no outside power funding this or anything like that. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're in 1933. However, one one of the um, one of these generals it, mm. is a bit more uh, greedy. His name is Fulgencio Batista. Okay. Um, in 1940, he runs on a platform of what can only be described as centrist populism. Mm where he tries to appeal to the masses, but he also tries to be, like, I don't know, like, kind of, like, a strong compromiser. Hmm. A strong leader, a compromiser, and a populist. Oh, yeah, I understand. A strong leader, but he doesn't take any extreme political positions. Is that both on economic and social issues that he's a centrist? Um, yeah, or he's okay. trying to, or at least, at the very least, that's what he's trying to portray himself as. Okay, so, but he's, he's a populist. He presents himself as a man of the people, but he is a strong leader. And yes. his name's Batista. Yeah. Okay. And, um, he, he gets elected to the presidency in 1940, but his, what do you... Okay, so there's some time here still, 1933, 1940... Um, so it sounds like there's some other leaders between 19... There's another president, at least one other president before him, but this person doesn't do anything of significance. Yeah. Okay. So each president is supposed to rule for four years, you know, kind of okay. like the U.S. Right. Okay. Um, so in Batista's first four years, he okay. is not that popular. He, wow. At election, he was a very good campaigner, mm. but... His attempts to try to work with both sides um, just resulted in people in in people being like be consistent, and he he just ended up and he tried to draw on the military support, but but then everyone was like, oh great, not another dictator. Oh, I understand. So there were, there were two or at least two factions. What was one a more right leaning faction, one a more left leaning faction? I mean it's. He's They're, trying to straddle the line between, he's trying to unite the two and bring them together under his leadership, but he's not successful in that. The factions are divided. Yeah. Okay. And so seeing that he's unpopular, he tries to get a, 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 very, a person who's very loyal to him, a puppet, I guess you could say, mm -hmm. elected, but, they don't, but the people don't elect that puppet. They elect mm -hmm. some other guy who's... Who's just okay, but nobody's mad at him. Oh, so he's not able to control the outcome of the election. Yeah. I see. So, um, so some election cycles go through, but Batista is not giving up. Hmm. And eventually, um, and then eventually, in 1945, World War II ends, right? So, and after, and after, uh, 1945, um, the U.S. is friendliness towards communism, which was already on the decline since 44, right. had started to, you know, turn into the conditions for the Red Scare. That's right, because we were, uh, we were, a lot, or we were allied with the Soviets uh -huh. during World War II, but then soon after, in the, in the late 19, the mid to late 1940s, after World War II, all of a sudden we, we flipped and were, were uh, anti-communist. Yeah. With some so with some socialists uh, winning elections in Cuba, Batista uh, had had some of the tools he needed to try to convince the U.S. that Cuba was trying to turn communist. Okay. And and because for so long Cuba had been you know unstable, he he was uh, there had just been this image in the U.S. consciousness of Cuba as this 
unstable wasteland of warlords. Mm. So combining these two factors, Batista was able to convince the U.S. that he needed to bring order and stop communists from taking over Cuba. Okay. So, so this is what, the late 1940s at this point? Um, 1951. 1951, okay, so at this point the U.S. government has become um, anti-communist. Yes. You know, we, have, we have an interest in fighting communism. Korea, on the other side of the world, we also have Cuba, which is right, you know, uh, Havana is 90 miles away from Key West, Florida. So we have right in our own backyard, we have potential communist revolution. So does the U.S. step in at this point? Did they respond to Batista? In 1950, they ele elevate him. They, the U.S. military turns Batista into a military dictator. Mm. They, they give him the troops and support he needs to basically... Oh, so, so U.S. soldiers are sent down there? Yeah. U.S. soldiers, okay. Also, U.S. propagandists are sent to try to make this take over more popular with Cubans, because okay. Cuba... How, how does that work? Through the television, radio? Um, radio, Print. propaganda posters, you know. Okay, all right, I understand. Okay. Yeah. It was the, the, the popular means of propaganda at that time, right? Mm -hmm. were, were posters, radio, and television. Yeah. Is that right? Okay. So, Batista it is backed by the U.S. military, and people don't really like this, but what are they going to do against the U.S. military? All right, because at this point, the U.S. military is incredibly powerful after the buildup from World War II. Yeah. And, but there are some people who have hope that they can um, kick, kick the U.S. out again and become independent, as so many Cubans wanted. Okay. Among these was a man named Fidel Castro. Mm, that name sounds familiar. Yes. So, a bit of backstory on Castro. He, he was originally born to a wealthy Spanish family, but went to the University of Havana to study. Mm, okay. And there he didn't... He wasn't yet a communist, mm. but he did pick up very, very anti-imperialist ideas. Now that's what... Let me just stop you there for a second. That's interesting. He grew up in Spain, Yeah, came from a wealthy family. Why would a wealthy sp Spaniard family send their son to Havana? Um, they, had a, they had a pretty decent law school. Oh, so okay, they studied... Especially in the 40s. Interesting, so he went there for law school to study... Was he going to... Um, I wonder what his intention was, to go back to Spain? I wonder if this law degree was, was valid in any way in Spain. Perhaps it was, but... Anyway, so we don't... Okay, I was just curious if that was that was something uh, common where maybe the wealthy families were sending their sons to Havana or something. But anyway, so he goes to Havana. He comes from a wealthy family in Spain, goes to Havana to study law mm -hmm. in the 1940s. But at this point, and then is he involved in politics? He, you, you said he, he first dabbled in or first became interested in communism at that point. So he must have been involved in communism, um or the Communist Party by the 1950s, right? Well, here. Before he went to university, he actively considered himself not just apolitical, but mm -hmm. politically illiterate. Okay. When he went to Havana, he, he wasn't quite a communist yet, mm. but he did become very anti-imperialist. That became his number one issue that he would not back down on. Oh, interesting. Partially, which may have, you know, part of that might be that most Cubans were like, Kick out the imperialists. No more Americans. No más España. No más americano. Okay. So, um... So he was a populist in that regard. Even though he came from this wealthy family, he identified with the, um, the popular opinion among the Cuban people, which was anti-imperialist. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, there's evidence that he had, at the very least, read Marx. Um, mm -hmm. there's serious debate whether he actually believed in that many of Marx's ideas at this mm. point. Okay. Um, and what we do know is that at the very least he was willing to work with Catholics and business leaders who were sympathetic to the anti-imperialist cause. Okay. So I'm assuming if he's from Spain, he was likely raised Catholic. Yeah. Okay. Um, so he... So in... Um, in 51, he, 
So, all throughout um, Batista's reign, you know, there have been various minor uprisings against Batista, you know. M nothing was successful yet, but, you know, there was evidence of people trying to resist. Hmm. So then Castro thought, hmm, maybe if I can rally support and, and you know, s spread, you know, posters, whatever, to all the people saying, hey, if we work together we can resist Batista then maybe we might be able to get our mass uprising and just simply overwhelm Batista's military forces. Hmm. So, Castro um, and his brother Raul Castro, mm -hmm. they work together and they recruit a small band of people, um, about 200. Um, they, they, fund they fundraise as much as they can and get about $200 worth of guns and other equipment. Wow, two hundred dollars worth of guns. So Yeah, they they've been fundraising. I mean whatever. we're talking this is this is the nineteen fifties, so inflationary um, even with inflationary pr uh, um, calculations, what's that worth today? A thousand dollars worth of guns? Or I think two hundred dollars is adjusted for inflation. Two hundred dollars oh so that's that's you, like what what gun can you buy could they even buy one gun? For two hundred dollars, or I'm I'm not sure. I I've, we're not you're sure we're not talking about two hundred thousand dollars or anything like that. Like two hundred dollars, you might be able to buy one used gun or something like that. You know what it, I mean? Now I got that mixed up. Two hundred dollars is the before inflation. Never mind. Okay, well it's I mean still the whole point is it's a very small amount. So let's yeah. say if we calculate we calculate that might be a thousand. I'm I'm just gonna throw this number out there. That might be worth a thousand dollars in today's money. Maybe yeah. maybe two thousand tops. Anyway. The whole point is if you go out and buy guns, you only have a few guns. So if, if he only has, whether it's 200 or $2,000, if he's buying that many guns, or that, that few guns, versus the might of the U.S. military, the point is that he is seriously outgunned. Yeah. So first he attacked, but remember, in 1951, the U.S. was fighting the Korean War, so some of their forces had withdrawn, and... Their presence was more like, hey, just, their presence was more centralized, you know, around Batista himself. Okay. So Castro found a barracks. Do we, do we have any idea what the size of the U.S. presence was in Cuba? Um, it was comparable to their presence, it was probably smaller than their presence in, say, West Germany. Okay, and I, I don't know what that was, but I, I was just curious if he knew if there was a certain number of, of soldiers that were there, 1,000 soldiers, 10,000 soldiers. Yeah. We don't know. Okay. So it wasn't a significant, uh, would that be safe to say? It was, it was not a large presence. Yeah. Really interesting, though, that if we, if we get to, want to just talk about the U.S. for a second, really interesting that we did not have such a significant presence in Cuba, which is 90 miles away from Florida. 90, ways, 90 miles away from the United States, yet we have this massive, a much, much, a very significant presence on the other side of the world in Korea. Mm -hmm. Okay, so anyway, so we have but there some is, presence, but it may not be a very significant one. But the U.S. did provide something that was in similar value to, you know, just straight up troops. They okay. provided people to help not only recruit people to become loyal to Batista, but also train those who could, who would be loyal in, um, you know, in fighting and stuff. Okay, so. so it wasn't just the actual U.S. presence there. We were training Cubans to be loyal to Batista. Yeah, training Cuban soldiers specifically. Okay, training Cuban soldiers. Okay, so, but the Castro brothers have a very small amount of funds. They buy a few guns with it. And I'm, I'm assuming they have some sort of guerrilla force, some sort of... Have, do we know what size the, his, um, his following is at this point? Um, we don't know the size of all of his followers everywhere in Cuba, but we know that this first assault, assault that I want to get to mm. was about 160. Okay, so he's about 160. The amount of guns they have... They, I mean, if they... they all, yeah, they couldn't even all be armed. They could really only buy a few guns with Yeah, some of them probably, you know, some of them may have already had guns beforehand. I but, see, okay. But what Castro wanted to do is he spotted a barracks called the Moncada Barracks. Okay. The Moncada, you know, as a barracks, would have a lot of guns. 
Right. And it was primarily guarded by these Cubans that were trained by the U.S. rather mm. than actual U.S. men. Okay. So Castro's plan was to take, take the barracks, mm. or actually not just take the barracks, he was to attack the barracks that would show... Mm. Uh, to get enough success to serve as, I guess you'd say, a new hope hmm. to the Cuban people, causing all of them to rise up and, uh, and have just such sheer numbers that it would be overwhelming. And plus, if he could take the barracks, then that would be more guns. Okay. However, his plan does, it does not go according to plan. Hmm. It, he, it, his forces are repelled. The, the Cuban soldiers, as it turns out, were not loyal were not interested in his anti-imperialist cause, mm. and the pe and the people were not inspired by a ragtag group of 160 men, a few, some of which may have, may or may not have been armed, mm. attacking a Cuban barracks. Okay, and eventually the force is defeated. Um, many of in the squad are executed, and Fidel and uh, Raúl themselves are put in prison. Mm. That's interesting that they were caught and not executed, even though they were leading this. Yeah. Some, some of the they people were, following him were executed, but he or was... The, or the Cuban, unless it, like, some of them, usually, the executions were um, mainly on the part of the U.S. The, mm. uh, Batista didn't really feel that much like executing his own, uh, Cub his fellow Cubans. Mm. Uh, but he did. But he did um, capture Raúl and Fidel. Um, mm. Avoided executing most of them, but the U.S. was like, "Okay, these guys are pr would probably rise up again if you release them." Hmm. Okay. Well, they let the uh, one who ended up being the leader go. Okay. So, so the Castro brothers go to prison. They what happened? What happens there? Is there a trial, or is it just? Or do they not have that there? They're just like, "Hey, you guys, problems are locking you away." Yeah, they just go straight to prison for a year. Okay. Those oh, one year. That's actually pretty lenient. I, to, to lead an uprising, to try to steal, but um, to be, steal a bunch of arms from the government, and they just say, yeah, just one year. But they didn't just release them back into Cuba. Instead, mm. what they did was they, after the... Basically, they were supposed to be in jail for a whatever amount of time, but mm. then after a year, Batista was like, okay... I'm exiling you to Mexico. You can, you're can, you not staying in Cuba, you're going to Mexico. Interesting. The reasoning for this I was unable to find sources for, but... Interesting. Going to Mexico... Well, you know, you know, one thing I'm thinking of, that, and this might have something to do with why they were not executed, they came from a wealthy family. Mm. Maybe their family paid Batista or somebody, hey, don't, don't kill our sons. We'll give you some money. We've got money. And maybe after a year in prison, they said, hey, send our kids to Mexico. Yeah. We'll, we'll pay you. We'll give you money. Just don't keep them in this prison. You know, that maybe, I don't, I don't know. I'm speculating. Maybe that had something to do with it. It might have. Point is, they go to Mexico, and this ends up being extremely beneficial for Fidel, because he meets someone who is, who is basically the key to the Cuban Revolution's success. Hmm. Che Guevara. Sounds like a familiar name, too. Yeah. Born Ernesto Guevara. Che was a nickname he picked up. Mm -hmm. He was born to... He was born, you know, just below middle class in uh, in Argentina. Okay. He, he proved incredibly bright. Um, in fact, he actually ended up going... Uh, he actually ended up studying medicine at the University of Buenos Aires. Mm -hmm. But at some point, the stress of me of studying medicine that he um, decided to take a you know a cup a vacation for a couple of years, just touring around South America. Hmm. Okay, so I guess being a political revolutionary is, is less stressful than being a doctor. I mean, I, and he I mean he got <laughs> he tours and maybe, he, maybe more exciting. I mean, it's definitely I mean, more exciting. Be, you're, you're, you could be, you could be killed or locked away in a prison for the rest of your life at any moment. Might be, might be a little stressful, but okay. Anyway, point is, he, 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 he just doesn't like medicine that much or whatever. But he, he goes around. He, he tours. He's like, oh, huh. 
I don't really like what's happening to these people, you know, some of these, you know, obviously, you know, not all of these countries were in absolute poverty, but where he did see poverty, he was like, this is unacceptable, there should be no poverty. Okay, so he's and, a champion of the poor. And he's been reading a lot of Marx and kind of liking Marx's ideas. Mm -hmm. So then eventually he... What year are we at? By now, mid-1950s? Um, I'm going to Che Guevara's backstory, which was early 50s. Okay, okay. But anyways, um, he goes back to Buenos Aires. Mm -hmm. He finishes his medical degree. Mm -hmm. He He's not the best medical student, but, mm -hmm. you know... But that doesn't matter because he he has something even more important to him than uh, medicine, mm -hmm. which he was never that good at, at in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, he he is uh, he wanted to fight for communism. Okay. So he he heard something was going on in Cuba and thought, okay, that might be a good place to um, do his whole communism thing. Mm -hmm. So he goes up. So he goes up north, stops in Mexico, and. Wouldn't you know it, in 1950, in, uh, shortly after the Castro brothers arrived in, um, Mexico, uh, Che meets, uh, Raul Castro, and Raul then introduces Che to Fidel, and, you know, Fidel is, still isn't completely convinced of communism, but mm. Che, A, is able to bring him closer to that side, at the okay. very least. Mm. And he, and uh, Che offers his support, and Fidel is like, "All right, if you can help us recruit people, if you can help us, then we'll take the help." Okay. And Che immediately, and soon they uh, sneak their they sneak their way back into Cuba, and Che immediately sets to work, hmm. giving rousing speeches to get the people on his side, and. Do we know how long the Castro brothers were in Mexico? Um, like a year. A year or so, okay, so a year, they meet with Che. Did they build up any kind of following there, or is it, is it just the two brothers and Che who come back? Um, they get a few people, but mm -hmm. most of their recruitment happens when they, after they sneak back to Cuba. They sneak back to Cuba, and this time they have a much bigger following mm -hmm. of people, of people, many of which actually have guns. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. They're able to build up this falling, even though they've been exiled. So they must have to keep their identity secret, but yet they are able to build up a following. Yeah. Uh, mainly because Che is just that charismatic. Oh, uh, okay. Interesting. And eventually, um, and eventually, the U.S. has to recall yet more troops because of the Vietnam War. Hmm. Um, and this, in 1957, is what uh, is what makes this um, the 26th of July movement they call themselves in reference to the Moncada uh, seizure being on the 26th of July. This is when they decide to strike. Okay, so the U.S. Pull, have they pulled out their entire military presence out of Cuba at this point? Uh, they've pulled out enough. I pulled in enough. That's that's really interesting. So they have this. Like we talked about before, they have this island, this country, that is right next to the United States. And they pull their military presence out of that to go fight communism on the other side of the world. Meanwhile, communists, right in the backyard of the United States, are plotting a revolution. So what happens there? So, with the U.S. being more concerned with um, the active communists, um, rather than the secret communists in Cuba... Mm. Um, plus they had defeated a revolution, like, just in, plus they had defeated the Moncada Rebellion with Cuban troops, so right, they thought that Cuba, one. so they thought Cuba could handle itself anyway. So they didn't, they didn't take these revolutionaries seriously. Yeah. Okay. So, then Che, I uh, who made that call. What? I wonder who made that call. Um, let's see, the president at that time was... 1857. president was... We'll we'll put the president on, we'll put the president on screen. We'll you'll we'll figure it out. Yeah. So Che leads the strike. He except except he, Che Che may not have that much military experience, mm -hmm. but he clearly has a talent for it, a natural talent, because he is able to use guerrilla tactics 
to um, basically make it get to, to outsmart Batista at nearly every turn. Mm -hmm. um, using uh, guerrilla warfare to weaken Batista's forces um, um, and, sil and uh, hide, his, hide his location and mm -hmm. uh, st steal arms, whatever he needs to do. Right, because Batista's forces have been trained by the U.S. military. Yeah. Who may have some experience in guerrilla warfare. I mean, look at look at how they, the U.S. military fought in Vietnam, right? Yeah. But as far as they are defending targets, they're defending um, armories, they're defending buildings, government buildings, they're defending property, they're not really in the position to be staging guerrilla attacks. Their enemy could be spread out all over and could emerge anywhere. Yeah. And after a year of these relentless guerrilla strikes, uh, Che eventually has enough force to sweep into Havana and kick um, and kick Batista out, mm. ex okay. executing Batista, executing any suspected counter revolutionaries. So, what do, what do the people of Cuba think of all this? Are they involved in it? They're swept up in the excitement of kicking out the U.S. Okay, so the people are backing. The backing um, Che and the Castro brothers. Remember, communism is not what they're advertising. They're advertising anti-imperialism, anti okay. and they are delivering on that. Okay, so the people don't either know, don't know or don't care that these are communist revolutionaries. They just care that they are anti-imperialist, and they're going to kick out. They're going to defeat the U.S. trained troops that serve under Batista and. They are probably advertising themselves as we are going to return the power to the Cuban people and remove the anti-imperialists. So they have the backing of the Cuban people at this point. Yeah. They stage a year-long um, guerrilla, a, a set of guerrilla, I'm, I'm assuming relentless guerrilla attacks for a yes. whole year against Batista's men until Batista is so weakened that they're able to go into Havana and take the capital. Yes. And with this, they are able to, they eventually consolidate their control over the rest of the country, and they eventually control the country. The U.S. Okay, once they take the capital and they've, and they've overcome Batista's men, the rest of the country comes easily, I'm assuming. Yeah. Okay. The U.S. Especially when they have the will of the people behind them. Yeah. The U.S. realizes what has happened. And this begins the Bay of Pigs invasion. Okay, that's Wait. what I was thinking. If this guerrilla guerrilla strikes are going on for a year, where where is the U.S.? Just all its energy is over in Asia. Yeah, all its focus is on Asia. They're ignoring what's going on right in the backyard. Okay, so the Bay of Pigs. Bay of Pigs invasion. They try to invade South Cuba, but Che the Che Guevara now not only has talent but experience. Mm and a much larger supply of arms. And so he is able to kick the U.S. back to but a single fort in the south of Cuba, wow. which the U.S. are able to hold on to. Okay. And, event and eventually the, the U.S. basically just has to... Re eventually the U.S. realizes that, th that this is not going to work, and they, so, they drop, so they drop out of this. Um, pointless conflict to keep fighting the pointless conflict in Vietnam. <laughs> wow, that uh, that is really interesting. I mean, the might of the U.S. military, if they had the will to go in there, we have air power. I mean, do does 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 Che have helicopters? Does he have you know? Does he have bombers? Does he have fighter jets? You know what I mean? We we have air force bases in Florida. We could send uh, we could send aircraft over there easily, easily to take out his targets. So. I'm wondering, did we simply just not, did the U.S. just not have the will to fight it? Well, for one thing, um, the, you know, a lot of the U.S. was actually tied up in Vietnam. Like, withdrawal would, pro would take so long that it would be like... But on the other hand, it's not like the, the Cubans had no outside support. Because mm -hmm. after they were, they overthrew, but because with Che's excellent ta tactics made the Soviets realize that this revolution had potential. Okay. And so they started, you know, sending arms. At, at first it was just, you know... Not only the potential, they have a strategic ally right next to the United States. Yeah, so they... So the Soviets have a very strong incentive to do this. So they It's still just bizarre to me that the U.S. 
was not putting more resources into controlling this. You know, it may, it makes it makes me wonder what what was really the agenda behind it. What was was it was this just simply you know how how let's say let's say you're the commander in chief of the United States and you have this communist revolution happening right next to your country and you say oh you know we'll send a we'll send some maybe send the navy over there oh, that, didn't, that didn't go anywhere well let's just go let's just go worry about vietnam yeah <laughs> who cares what's going on here are that we're fighting a proxy war against the communist over there who cares if the soviets are going to come here and and back this country right next to us you know yeah. it just seems like it it's so, it seems so bizarre that I mean, I don't know what information they had at the time, but looking at it, whoever is in charge was either just stupid, like just literally just stupid, or they knew exactly what they were doing, and they were they they wanted to have communists here. They were letting it happen. They said, "Yeah, let's let's maybe it's it's good for business. It's good for politics. We need some communists right in our backyard that we can um, you you know use for whatever purposes." I don't know. I really don't know. I'm just. I just think it's interesting. So anyway, so the Soviets start to back them. Yeah. Uh, they at first just ammunition, but then like actual aircraft get sent over, hmm. and and eventually Cuba, and eventually. And that's significant. So you have you have hostile um, air force bases with. I mean, if you're in a fighter jet, to go 90 miles is nothing. To hit to hit you get to South Florida, that's nothing. You know. You can do that in no time. You could be over there in a few minutes. The one thing about that, though, is that that's like, like the thing is that Guevara is an expert in guerrilla tactics, so that so that would only accomplish so much. Okay, so he's he's not planning to launch an attack on the United States because then he knows that's going to result in just this full scale reaction, or you would think it would. Yeah. He just wants to have this. Maybe maybe it's more of a defense mechanism now if the. U.S. You know we have we have an uh, air force base, for example, in Tampa Bay. If we wanted to send planes down there, he has his own air defenses. Yeah. Okay. So um, so now uh, Che Guevara and uh, Fidel Castro and Raúl Castro they they begin setting up their government and um, consolidating their control. Okay. Guevara at Guevara has a uh, intr. Guevara is mainly just about setting a communist government. Like okay. his first, his goals are to try to convince Castro to fully embrace communism mm -hmm. and to try to set up a communist enough government that uh, Guevara can go create more communist governments. Hmm. Okay. And does does he model his communism, for example, after the Bolsheviks or after the Maoists? Guevara does he have his own brand? Is 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 a, the uh, you know the Latin American version of Marxism? Guevara is very clearly Leninist. Oh, okay. But and Le Lenin was in Mexico, wasn't he? You're thinking of Trotsky. Oh, Tro um, oh my mistake. Tro okay, so he's not a Trotskyist. He may have met Trotsky. Or. Trotsky what? died in the twenties. Oh, I think. Never mind. He didn't meet Trotsky. <laughs> okay. I just knew. I just knew. Yeah. I just knew one of them went. Oh, okay. So that that has nothing to do. So he he was much later. Okay. Yeah. So okay. So he's a Leninist. Yeah. Uh, he says I'm gonna I'm gonna do Leninist style Marxism in Cuba. However, Castro is um, not as full on about the Leninism thing. Hmm. He's a he wants to he's. He's open to the idea of incorporating communist elements yeah. in, in order to try to, if he thinks they'll strengthen Cuba. Okay. So he does things like, you know, socialized medicine mm. and, um, and programs that basically say, hey, everybody has to work. And mm. he creates state-sponsored companies, but uh, he doesn't, he still allows private and personal property, and he mm. um, and he uh, creates a, a system where, like, I don't even know how to describe. Interesting. it. Interesting. What? Well, I mean, this in the Soviet Union, um, who was it? Or there was Gorbachev, and then who was it before Gorbachev? Uh, Khrushchev. Khrushchev. Didn't Khrushchev have something similar where he had he had elements of Marxism? 
but he also had more moderate things. Yeah, and so, and it is important to note that Stalin did die, that Stalin died in fifty three. Fifty three. Okay, we're talking about the late nineteen fifties, right? Yeah. So Khrushchev was in power, in in the Soviet Union at this time. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so so Castro is probably some something closer to Khrushchev. Yeah. Um, Che is a true believer in communism. Yeah. <laughs> he is he is a he's he's an ideologue. Yeah. Okay. So with Cuba, so Cuba initially is officially part of the non-aligned movement of faction. Okay. Well, I have one other question. With how was Cast? What was Castro's view on the church? You said he was he was a Spaniard. He was originally Catholic. Did he close all the churches? Did he allow? some Catholicism to exist? Uh, he, he was, Castro himself was an atheist, and he, person, and he, he didn't do any favors for the church, but it wasn't like, you know, it, full on persecution. He didn't completely shut it down, did he allow some of them to operate? Yeah, he allowed some of them to operate, mm -hmm. but he, at the, but he tried, but he tried to, you know, do set church and, separation of church and state and a bit more. Okay. So just like, you know, Promoting a very secular education. Mm, okay. Um, much to what the have here. much to the nice. much to the dismay of uh, Guevara, who oh, who is Guevara is a hardliner. He he says close all the churches. Right? Yeah. He's, he, what is he like? Just execute the priests? Is he is he that sort of is he that type? It's not known exactly what he wanted and. Um, um, because Guevara never commented much on religion, so we so we can assume that he that he probably would have kept within Leninist principles of like you know uh, try of uh, trying to uh, shut shut down the churches, mm. but he but he but religion was the topic Guevara talked the least about because okay. for Guevara the most important thing was um, economics okay. and. Uh, all that jazz. Okay. So, so officially Cuba is part of the non-aligned movement faction, which is a faction started by Yugoslavia for people who don't, who want to re uh, refrain from being involved in the Cold War. Hmm. However, however, see, however, on the back side of things, egged on by uh, Guevara, they are receiving support from the USSR. Hmm. Um, and this will lead us into what we'll talk about in our next episode, which is the Cuban Missile Crisis. Okay. Um, but until then, uh, we've been talking for a while, so... Yeah, I think that's a good stopping point. We discussed a lot about the Cuban, we covered a lot of territory about the Cuban Revolution, or the Cuban Communist Revolution, so good job, Sebastian. Did you have any final words you wanted to say? Um... Just Castro's like, cows. We're gonna talk about that in the next episode, right? Castro's cows. I yeah, because I think he started like the dairy stuff in 1960. Yeah. So, so thank you everybody for joining us for our discussion on the communist revolution in Cuba. Uh, this was the first episode. We're gonna be continuing with the second episode, including um, the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is very important, and. Castro's Cows, which I think is, is Sebastian was telling me about that before. It's pretty funny. So tune in for our next episode and learn all about that. And thank you all, and good night. I said good night. It's like people might be watching it during the day, but you know. You can just cut that out. Yeah, it's, uh, I, maybe I'll leave it just because it's funny. All right. Good work, Sebastian.